Welcome to this unit. The title is Chief Seattle. It is a unit in prose for ICSC syllabus. The weightage is 16 marks. This video will give you some basic idea before we approach the speech delivered by Seattle. Born to a Squamish and a Duwamish parent, Chief Seattle was originally named Seals. He later grew into a very formed personality with courage, daring, and a kind heart and excellent leadership skills. He was profoundly a representative of Red Indians living in America and also a firm believer in the power of nature. In the early times since Red Indians lived more so in their nativity, they had close companionship with nature and their own society. They would not know that Washington was the name of the president and not the city. The Americans won't mind this since they were more ashamed of being ruled by the England woman. This speech delivered by the Chief Seattle has often been challenged in, the, in terms of authenticity. The date, location and some native expressions remain to be interpreted at the mercy of the reporters and historians. The speech was addressed to a large gathering after a meeting called by Governor Isaac Stevens to discuss the occupancy of native land. After Seattle was briefed about this proposal, he rose and spoke in his native language that later was translated into other languages including English. Dr. Henry A. Smith had still only been able to record and narrate in his work the excerpts of Seattle's speech that talked about the generosity of the whites and the firm take of Red Indians' land excess. However, this version of the text that you will be studying is considered closest to the original address that Chief Seattle made. He is still regarded as one of the most impressive speakers of his time, a gentleman by instinct and known for his native eloquence. His appearance itself showed his grace, bright eyes, expressive and reposed. He stood confident in his being, yet with a demeanor of a silent, calm and dignified individual. His highest word in all trustworthiness was law. With his magnificent bearing, Chief Seattle rose to speak. The white settlers had proposed to buy the land of Red Indians which they had been native to for countless decades. Therefore, Seattle's word was highly looked forward to by the whites as well as his own people. As a gentleman, Seattle not only had high honor from his natives but also was flattered with distinct attention by the whites. He suddenly flourished with all qualities of a gentleman. The very distinct personality of Seattle and his honor always gained him clear attention. His husky voice had a sound impact on the listeners and arrested their attention enchantingly. The moment arrived when the white group clearly mentioned their purpose of visit, after which Seattle rose to speak, delivering this famous speech. His word was no less than that of a responsible senator addressing in solemn and impressive tone. At this point, Seattle addresses the gathering. His speech focuses on the aspects such as the losing power of the tribes, ability to know when to surrender, considering and acknowledging that their gods have been different and will remain different, but they will respect each other. Within a few months after this event, a treaty named Point Elliot Treaty was signed which declared the movement of Red Indians to their reserved areas with promise to get supplies, having fishing and working rights, but not live in Seattle. 
as an extension to Point Elliot Treaty, the Port Madison Indian Reservation was set aside, declaring specifics of the Red Indian occupancy of reserved land. This was documented a year after the Elliot Treaty. After procuring the lands, they were put to sale by the whites for new settlers to prosper. They were mainly marketed as irrigated, irrigable, grazing land, agricultural and dry farming since Red Indians valued the ecology higher than any other virtue that they had splendidly taken care of all natural resources. Though the US National Congress had promised the Red Indians all the rights, their expansion in power and prosperity had soon resulted into the Indian reserved lands to shrink. As you can see in the map, the Red Indians eventually lost most lands only to remain scattered over small pieces of lands. Most part of the negotiation here took place peacefully. However, with shrinking population and loss of power, the resistance of tribes eventually proved futile against the unmasked power of the whites. It was later procurement only by one of the two means, a peace word or by force. As it is, the reservation period had called for a lot of unsettling for the Red Indians. Having to lose roots, they also gave up on their ancestral belonging to the land that had a major influence on their lives. It was more so a setback and a sentimental loss for the tribals. Eventually, with the US deciding to finally bring humanity equality and the grace of coexistence into being decided to grant full U.S. citizenship to all the Red Indians under the presidency of Calvin College in 1924. Chief Seattle very aptly talks about why the day and night can't dwell together in his speech addressed. He relates the differences between whites and Indians in their beliefs in the ancestors, the gods and goddesses or father and the heroism that they have differed thoughts on. This tells us that it's a coexistence of two cultures, one that has a separate god. Several agreements were signed between the whites and the red Indians considering the latter's close bond with the land. Since their graves were a part of their living land, they had firm demands to be allowed to visit the graves without any restriction. This resulted into Native Americans' Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Chief Seattle was not only an honorable representative of the Red Indians, but was also regarded as an ecologist. In his speech, he claims that every tribal considers every inch of their land sacred. The hills, the valleys, the rocks, the shore, the dust, the trees are all an inseparable part of their living. However, a later part of the history also tells us that the land to be occupied by the red was separately allocated. But owing to the power and expansion of the whites, the shrinking continued until when the Indian lands had fallen to only 78 million acres from the original allotment of 138 million acres. Our iconic figure cannot but certainly leave a firm impression of his deep love and regard for his tribe and more for his nature. We just part with this one important message. Everything is connected. Thank you.